Thank you for coming today. It's a new time for the State of the University Address. The fall semester is different than we've done it in the past. Um, I'm going to take my time, a lot to cover today. I'm going to follow sort of a formula as the State of the X Addresses do. You talk a little bit about the past accomplishments. Then you talk about the challenges and the opportunities that you're facing. And then talk about what's next. What are the next steps that you're going to take? I'm going to use the last three years as the time frame for some of the accomplishments. And it's really been an exciting three and a half years since I've arrived. Just think about some of the things that have happened. Uh, New York State passed the historic New York SUNY 2020 legislation that brought new resources, new faculty, and new students to our campus. President Barack Obama visited our campus, hailing the quality and value of the education that our students receive. A feature film, The Rewrite, written and directed by Binghamton alumnus Mark Lawrence, brought the Binghamton name into millions of households. New York's southern tier, with the university figuring prominently, won three consecutive Best Performer Awards in Governor Andrew Cuomo's Regional Economic Development Council program, bringing nearly $270 million in funding to strengthen the region's economy. And I should always note, we are the smallest of all of the 10 regions in New York State. And just this year, Binghamton University was named one of the 25 healthiest campuses in the nation. And one of only 35 public universities in the United States as an innovation and prosperity university by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. I talked a lot about getting bigger is getting better, if you do it right. And we have gotten bigger. And I think, other than some bumps along the road, I think we have done it right. This year, the enrollment of our students is shown in this table. Uh, we're still under 17,000, which is our SUNY 2020 goal, but we're approaching it very quickly. It's great to know as we've been growing our student population, our freshman class quality has remained constant, and this year actually it's up from last year, crossing the 1300 mark, approximately 1303. As I remind you also, there's going to be a lot of data presented today. I won't be able to show every number on the screen, but there'll be some booklets that you can grab on the way out that will give you the information in a little more detail. And I think we also should be proud of our efforts and admissions in reaching out and recruiting from underrepresented minority students. And the enrollment for our undergraduate underrepresented minority students is up 36% over these three years and 58% for graduate students. Bring in more students, you gotta have more people. Certainly faculty are going to be critical as well as the staff that needs to, needed to support the student population. I like to count tenure track faculty. They are the ones who have the most vested interest in our success. And if we look at our new tenure track faculty over the last several years, since fall of 2011 is the comparison date, and the net tenure track faculty growth, you can see that we've hired 200 more individuals, 200 more faculty in the last four, three and a half years, uh, and the net growth in that faculty is 120. And I think you can also see that the distribution of them are relatively proportional to the sizes of each of the schools and colleges. So that we are now 587 tenure track faculty versus 467 tenure track faculty in 2011. At the same time, our staff has been growing. You can see the, by division, the net increases and the total staff in each one of the divisions. Uh, Patrick Elliott was a little concerned when I showed him that he lost 16 positions. He didn't realize that that had happened. And actually, that's a, an effect of transferring uh, the health and wellness academic department out of athletics and into academic affairs. So most of that 16 is just a transfer from one column of the numbers to another column. And What's also nice to know is that we are increasing the diversity of our faculty and our staff. 
that the underrepresented minority faculty grew by 46% in this period and our staff grew by 47%. Let's take a look at some of our new faculty. And that's just this year's freshman class. The, student, the faculty who are starting in the fall of 2015, we couldn't fit the other 155 of them on the screen. And some of our new staff, and I think you'll recognize some of the faces in this picture. And 165 approximately net new staff that we've added in the last four years. So you've got new students, they're smart. You've got new faculty. You've got new staff. They're all working very hard. You've got to put them in a great place. And when you walk around the campus, I think everyone will agree, this is a great place. It's had a few construction fences up over the last few years, which drive me kind of nutty, but most of them are coming down. There's only a few that you can still see on the campus here. But let me just go through some of the new buildings, some of the buildings that have been significantly renovated. The Center of Excellence on the Innovative Technology Campus, a $30 million building doing research in small-scale systems and integrated packaging for electronics and electro energy-efficient electronics, as well as some work in the health sciences. The Dickinson community came online two and a half years ago, adding 900 net new places, new beds, where students can live, and they are gorgeous, a great place to be a student. Just last week, we opened up our new turf field which is a recreation field for intramural sports and our club sports. It'll be open till late at night, well lit, and you're gonna see a lot of activity out there. Our students need a place like that in order to gain their, their physical activity and a little bit of their mental health back as well. The University Union has been significantly renovated. Certainly the marketplace is the signature space inside of there, but we've also expanded and upgraded the educational opportunity program and the TRIO office as well as the Career Development Center in the first floor. We've added dozens of classrooms that have more than 1,000 net new seats in them. Uh, when you think about growing your student population, there's gotta be one thing on the top of your mind. Is there a place for them to sit down in the classes that they're taking? And we made sure that they're online in time for that growth. And notice the picture to the right, the coal plant. The coal, the central heating plant, fired with coal, will no longer burn coal. It's going to be converted completely to biomass and wood chips starting in about a year and a half from now as we've been approved for that project. The Smart Energy Building on the ITC campus, where our chemistry and physics will be housed, will be completed over the next 18 months. A beautiful project that I think will, will add a signature space to the ITC campus. The downtown southern tier high technology incubator on the corner of Hawley and Lyle will be a place where approximately 20 to 25 new small companies can exist, as well as projects generated by students at Binghamton University and SUNY Broome. And a lot of talk, and we're moving along very well. In fact, I think we'll have our last steering committee meeting today for the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences building in Johnson City four-story building that will sit prominently in the same location that the first Endicott Johnson building was built. And then this talk about this castle thing. Yes, we have a castle. Well, not really. We have the opportunity to help program the castle. Um, when Assemblywoman came to me and said, would you like to be the stewards of the castle? I said, we could do a good job at that. We could manage the, re the restoration. We could come up with great ideas for programs that could be in it, but we probably won't be the main uh, tenant or the main population inside the building, but we're glad to see it brought back to life and give it a new future. And we've been successful in getting our alumni to help us in some of these projects. Mark Zurek, for example, has contributed a significant amount of resources to help us almost double the size of our Center for Learning and Teaching Steve and Judy Fleischman has contributed money so that we can have a state-of-the-art career development center in the University Union. Charles Kim, relatively young alumnus, who has been contributing steadily over many years, has decided to help us build a Korean student center in one of the old Dickinson buildings. 
And just recently, we opened a new alumni center in Old O'Connor. And if you haven't had a chance to go in there, please do stop in and see a place, a home, a stopping spot, uh, a place to say hello for our alumni, more than 110,000 of them. They certainly deserve it. And I really want to thank our alums and our support supporters, as well as the foundation board who manages our money, that our endowment has grown from 82 million in 2011 to over 120 million in 2015. So new students, more students. New faculty, more faculty. New staff, more staff. New buildings, better buildings, renovated buildings. Seems like we've got everything, right? Maybe not. We also need new approaches. We can't just do the same things over again. And so we created a concept called the Transdisciplinary Areas of Excellence just three years ago, forming committees of faculty who would help us decide what these areas are. What are we strongest in? And so there's five of them. Citizenship, rights, and cultural belonging. Sustainable communities. The material and visual world. Health sciences and smart energy. And each one of them has a group of faculty who are working hard to define what is the next breakthrough that needs to occur in there. What will be the next faculty member that we add into that group? Independent of what department that person will be in. What is the problem that we need to solve? And many of those problems don't sit in one discipline. They sit in many disciplines. And so the process of hiring faculty has changed. And of the 200 net 200 total new faculty we've hired, approximately 35% are in transdisciplinary areas of excellence. And we're growing our graduate programs. Specific call out to our faculty several years ago, give us new ideas. And over the course of those three years, we've got 22 new ideas, ranging from brand new programs, such as the Doctor of Pharmacy uh, program, or uh, modified programs or accelerated programs such as the undergraduate BA degree to the MPA degree and also some programs that we think are going to attract students into career directed masters and doctoral programs. And we've taken a new approach as to how we hire and how we identify where we need new staff support and it's the roadmap procedure. Every year we have a call for proposals. Those proposals are read by a steering committee voted upon, prioritized, and in a collaborative meeting of about 35 people that includes faculty, staff, students, alumni, and community members, we decide where we're going to put those precious new resources that we have. And the roadmap process in general has helped us develop things that are brand new. And when we think about what does the roadmap do, how does it allocate funds, we think about it's trying to support us. It wants to help us do things better. So for example, many of the projects focused on student success. So we've added significantly to our advising staff. We've grown and enhanced our Binghamton Scholars Program. And we have expanded the amount of undergraduate research opportunities that our student ha students have through funding in the roadmap process. We have improved our faculty's teaching abilities by creating the Center for Learning and Teaching and staffing it with instructional designers and also having a, a sandbox or a laboratory, so to speak, where faculty can test out new ideas and new methods of pedagogy. We've created a leadership development program that more than 200 people have gone through. We've created a division of diversity, and I give the division of diversity a lot of credit for helping us increase our minority population, both students, faculty, and staff, as well as guiding us through the cultural competency training that we offer our faculty, staff, and students, as well as conducting our campus climate survey last year. Our alumni engagement has been accelerated through this process. We had more than 1,000 volunteer alumni last year at significantly more events than we've ever had. That's about a 40% increase in four years. They've created a strategic plan for their, for their board and for their alumni association. And they've grown their chapters, the regional chapters, from four to 14 in just four years. And lastly, it's important. We're part of the community. We're an important part of the community, and we're a public part of the community. And that it's important for us to help create new opportunities in the region, not just through Binghamton University, but through all corporations and agencies in our area. And so serving as co-chair of the Regional Economic Development Council 
has been a way that, we can, that I've been able to contribute to that. I love talking about our faculty. They do some amazing things. It's so hard to pick which ones to talk about, so I won't mention any names. I'll just give you some of the highlights that have occurred over the last few years. We've won an enormous grant from the Department of Energy to understand the lithium battery technology and to increase the capacity of standard lithium batteries by almost a factor of four. We've been noted in the national press several times for a faculty member's research on the dark side of leadership. We've recently won a renewal grant from the National Institutes of Health to understand the impact of alcohol, specifically on adolescents. And one of our faculty members discovered the skull of the victim of the world's oldest murder. We have an author who sat at the top of the Kindle bestseller list. We have created new programs across the university to educate people on cultural competency. We've created a state-of-the-art, I think, once in a, in the, one in the world, freshman research immersion program, and I love the quote from Allison, no other school I was considering offered an introduction into research in such a structured manner. And just last week, we announced the largest research grant in the history of the university, a $20 million award to translate flexible electronics to commercial products. And there are so many more, I'd be here all day to tell you them. So what's next? Well, things look good. We've got some opportunities, but we've also got some challenges. The upstate economy is still stagnant. I was born and grew up in the upstate. I know that it has struggled over the years. But we've got a governor who knows it and believes that there's a way for us to change. And he's created the Upstate Revitalization Initiative. Enrollment for many of our graduate programs is flat. But we do know nationally, nationally career-directed graduate programs are in high demand. Financially, we have been preserved slightly by the state legislature through New York SUNY 2020, where they said, we will preserve your budgets. But then we found out just this year that we are responsible for salary increases. Our philanthropy performance has been improving, up significantly over the last few years. But we also know that our private support from our alums and our friends is behind our peers. So you think about these four sets of challenges and opportunities, and you start to put them together and you say, okay, how do I take advantage of them? What's the decision point from here? And I'm going to go back to 20 by 2020. 20,000 students by 2020. It's a really important goal. And it has to be done by enhancing our research, our profile as a research institution that has strong graduate programs as well as nationally recognized undergraduate programs. We've had PhD programs for 50 years. It's nothing new here, but we need to make it bigger. Our undergraduates, when we think about the 2020, 20 by 2020 goal, our undergraduates are almost there. We're almost at 14,000, and we've got several years to go, and the game now is to try to figure out how we smooth that out, how we take the bumps out of the enrollment in our undergraduates. But graduate students are only moving slowly and steadily towards our goal. Over the last four years, the numbers in the booklet you'll see We've only grown by about 480 graduate students. So the, the, the takeaway is we need to focus on graduate enrollment. We need to find ways to grow our graduate student population. And I talk about a 70-30 mix. Right now we're 80-20, 80% undergraduates, 20% graduate students. 70-30 is more like our peers. How do we get there? First of all, you have to break the problem down into two pieces. It's not just graduate enrollment. There's two distinct pieces of graduate enrollment. The first is your PhD programs. And we need to grow them. And there's strategies to grow them that everybody knows and everybody uses. It usually takes money and resources. But you have to spend them strategically. First, you have to hire really exceptional faculty, and I think we've been doing that. 
And once you hire them, you're going to encourage them to generate the support, the external support that they need to support the graduate programs. And typically, this is in the STEM fields. But once you hire that faculty member, you've got to make sure that they're successful. And the resources necessary to make them successful are significant. Our PhD students are great, but our offers are poor. We all know that. The stipend offers that we make to our PhD students have lagged behind our peers for years, and we've recognized that we just never knew where to find the money to make that happen. But through the roadmap process, we've made a commitment that stipends for PhD students starting in the fall of 2016 will be significantly increased to make our offers more competitive. We have to remember where we came from, Harper College. We have to continue to support our strongest graduate programs in the arts, social sciences, and humanities, because they are the ones that are going to provide critical guidance for our world's future. And as I talked about the TAEs, the transdisciplinary areas of excellence, we have to encourage the collaboration that it fosters as we address these global challenges. That's the first way of doing it. The second thing you have to do is you have to recognize that there's a huge demand right now for career-directed graduate programs, many of them in the health fields. And we're lagging behind. We know that we don't have enough of the programs, and we know that we don't have enough resources in those programs. So the goal is, how do you provide the support and the resources and the incentives to grow existing programs? And our provost has done a great job at this over the last few years. You won't see the benefit of that for a couple of years because it takes a while to grow new programs, the 22 that I listed earlier. And we have to continue to challenge our faculty to think of new programs and to look at the landscape out there. What are the big needs that our students are going to have in the future in order to make their careers successful? I think we're on the right path. This is kind of a race, too, though. We're not the only one who's having a state of the university address right now and laying out some plans and some options. Every single one of the universities is out there, just in our own backyard. You think of Stony Brook or Buffalo, almost twice our size, running and racing as hard as they possibly can. Our job as a smaller, mid-sized university has to be make sure we're in the right position to take, take advantage of opportunities. Because we're small, we're more agile. So we can move more quickly than some of the larger universities. And I think we work well as a university, not a divided set of colleges and schools. The School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, a significant investment in resources and time and talent. We know it's probably one of the fastest growing fields of research in the world. We've hired a new dean. We're expecting to have 360 Doctor of Pharmacy students, four-year programs by the time 2021 rolls around when we graduate our first cohort of students. We also anticipate our faculty to be active in funded research, and the estimate would be about 40 pharmaceutical sciences PhDs by the time we reach 2020, and we'll have about 55 faculty and staff. We're using the transdisciplinary areas of excellence approach. I think that that's going to enhance the quality of the faculty that we choose and that we hire, and how we support them once they come to the university. We're creating, I like to think of it as we're creating neighborhoods for our new faculty hires, not just a single house, a department, where they only know their immediate family members, but they know everybody in the neighborhood within their research areas. We've been using the roadmap process effectively over the last three years to invest critical new resources in areas of high need. And we have been successful at finding new programs that have high potential for growth. And as people know, taking them through that approval process is always a bit of a, of a hassle and it takes a long time, but we push and we prod and we make it through. And we have been making continued investments in existing programs that have growth potential. Again, bigger can be better if you do it right. More things Binghamton in the world. But we need a big idea. We're not, we're not there yet. In fact, we can hardly see the horizon sometimes when we think about these, these goals. But there's a huge opportunity right now. The Upstate Revitalization Initiative that the Regional Economic Development Council is working on, due in the first week of October, has the opportunity to bring, not to Binghamton University, but to the entire southern tier, of which we're part of, 
$500 million over five years. And then remember, I told you, we are the smallest region, competing against six other regions. Three regions are not qualified. Western New York, Long Island, and New York are not eligible. It's just the other seven upstate regions. We've got a great team that's put together a great proposal. The Regional Economic Development Council will meet and vote on it on September 10th continue to edit it as we move towards the October 5th deadline, and I believe we've got a great chance of winning it. How do we use that win as a university to help the community, help the region, and at the same time meet some of our goals? How do we leverage that win? Well, we've got a lot of help. We have great people in our community, great leaders, both in the nonprofit world as well as in government, uh, just throwing up some quotes from people like Alan Hertel and Debbie Preston, Assemblywoman Donna Lepardo, Greg Deamy, Richard David, our partners in this process, in our microcosm of the southern tier, the, Bingham, the greater Binghamton area. They're on our side. They're going to help us in this process. The Upstate Revitalization Initiative will have a significant emphasis on the southern tier specifically within the Triple Cities area. We're going to create three innovation districts. And these have already been uh, talked about, discussed, and approved by the Regional Economic Development Council, so there's not any uncertainty that this will be the focus of our proposal, one of the focus, foci of our proposal. And the three innovation districts, one will be in Endicott, surrounding the CAM, the Center for Advanced materials manufacturing that's in the Huron campus or the old IBM facility. That will be one innovation district. Second innovation district will be in downtown Binghamton surrounding the high-tech incubator. And the third and perhaps the most important and the one that has the most opportunity will be in the Johnson City Health and Cultural District right where our School of Pharmacy is being built. And what we are proposing to do is to create the Southern Tier Health Sciences and Technology Park. It'll be located at the existing facility of the pharmacy school, which is at 96 Corliss. It will also expand to the east to 48 Corliss. We're also looking at properties spread throughout Johnson City. And we believe that we can capitalize on not just using the upstate revitalization, but also using a community that is waiting for us with plenty of room. It'll build on our regional health care infrastructure. We're going to be close to UHS. It will link the Decker School of Nursing, which we are proposing to move to the Health Sciences and Technology Park. We are going to hopefully convince the Upstate Medical Clinical Campus, which is located right now near the castle in the Greater Binghamton Health Center, to join us in that facility. It will feature research and clinical facilities. We'll have interdisciplinary engagement. We'll be able to have faculty members and students from all of the different fields of health sciences, MDs, nurses, pharmacists, as well as social workers and engineers working in interdisciplinary teams in this health sciences campus. And we're going to establish a biopharmaceutical industry hub and offer space to companies who'd like to move here and take advantage of the benefits of Startup New York when they move across state boundaries. We really see this as a future growth in jobs but also in our reputation. It's a great opportunity. We have to win. It's a race. You've got to be in the right position to win a race. I think we've made really great choices so far. I think we're positioned well to reach our goal. But it's not going to be easy. And when I think about positioning, I think about races, I think about how hard it is to win a race, I think about one student. I think about Jesse Garn. Jesse Garn, senior. Jesse is uh, an All-American, 800-meter runner. Uh, Jesse's there. He's third or so in the pack. He's got green on. He's hardly even looking tired. He's looking at that guy from Maine, that guy from Vermont. They look a little more tired. This was the America East Championship last year that then allowed Jesse to go to the national championships. Jesse was in the right position to win. One by a mile. And that's where I think we are right now. 
we're sitting there, we're watching, we're waiting, we see our opportunities, we're ready to work hard. Look at the look on his face. I don't think you can find someone working harder right now, and I think we can see that across the entire campus. Thank you.